today. I want you to, to just stand up and greet the person next to you and say to that person, it's so good to see you today. I want you to do that right now. But you have to stand up. You need to give them a hug, shake hands, whatever. It's so good to see you today. I see some of the introverts stayed away from last Sunday because uh, this is so against everything that the introvert believes. You may be seated. Thank you, God. But you know, it's so good to be here, isn't it? It's so good to be together, especially right now because we are in the series about community and we've been talking about being a part of a team and being a part of God's team. And what I've said to you before is I've I've, 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 you know, I've gone to different lectures, motivational talkers, different conferences, and team, T-E-A-M, um, apparently no circle stands for together everyone achieves more. And it's so right because as a team, that's what it's about. We want to do it as a team. We want to achieve it as a team. And, and in a team, you've got different dynamics of people trying to work together to achieve the same purpose. And so I really agree with that. The team stands for together. Everyone achieves more. And we've been looking at community and we've been looking as well and trying to focus and, and narrow down to our church. And last Sunday I was saying that what we've got in mind to do this year, I can't do on my own. I need help. And each and every one of us here in a congregation has a talent in which they can tap into, we can tap into, and you can be a, a huge resource, not only to our church, but to the kingdom of God. And, um, you know, if you've been going to church before, or maybe another church, you probably heard somebody stand kind of in a place like I'm standing and talking to you about about something like I'm talking to you about, about community and, and what, it, what it, it means to be in community. They probably told you that community is good for you, and they were right. You probably heard this before, but that community is not only good for you, but it's, it is a God thing. Community is a God thing. There's actually a scientific journal called the Journal of Happiness Studies, it's published by a group of psychologists who are studying what, it make, what is it that makes people experience joy or happiness. And they find that there is one factor that time after time distinguishes more with people that are happy from the people that are less happy. And it's not what you would probably expect. It's not wealth. It's not intelligence. It's not attractiveness, it's not achievement, but it's, it's not how many, how many likes you get on Instagrams. The one factor they find over and over that distinguishes happy people from less happy people is the presence of a deep and meaningful relationships in their lives. That's what makes people experience happen, happiness. And they were saying that one of the top countries that actually experience happiness is Italy. I mean, have you seen an Italian? Have you ever come across an Italian? Hey? You think he's shouting all the time, but he's not, he's happy. Okay? And that's the way they talk. I mean, if you've ever been to a, a family, an Italian family, and been invited to supper, they are just joyful people. They are just full of life kind of people. And it doesn't matter what is happening in their life, there is just this togetherness because they know what family is all about. I mean, you've heard about the Italian mama, okay? She's like the rock of that, that family and they know what, what family is about. They have relationships and they're friends with anyone and everyone. And so they have become the number one country in the world to be on that scale of, of happiness. There's a professor at Harvard named Robert uh, Patnam to summarize the research this way, he said, the happiness is best predicted by the breadth and the depth of one's social connection. Just think about that for a moment. Think about your life. Happiness is best predicted by the breadth and the depth of one's social connection. And I was thinking about this particular thing this week. 
I was thinking about it the whole of this weekend and looking at my life. How true this has been through my life. And I was thinking about the first day of school. And and, and, and this one question in my mind in the first day of school is, is who's going to be my friend? Who's going to be my friend? And here's the thing is, I don't think that we ever actually grow out of that question. Hey? We don't actually get over that question. It doesn't matter how old we get. Who is going to be my friend? What connections am I going to have? And the reason we ask this question is because community is good for us. We are made for community. We are made to be in community. Now, if you've been to a church, you not only have heard that community is good for you, and it's a good thing, you've heard that it's a God thing. In other words, God's desire is for us to be in community with each other, and God's desire is for us to be in community with Him. He designed community. In the story of creation, all the way back in the book of Genesis, we find this really, really intriguing verse which Stephen shared with us. And it's a picture of God's perfect creation where there is no sin. I mean, the fall of Adam hasn't happened yet. No injustice, no pain. And we read in Genesis 2, Then the Lord said, It's not good for man to be alone. So in this perfection, there was something that was missing, and that was community. And so God made a partner to Adam. In all of the goodness of creation, there is this one outstanding not good, and it's aloneness. It's isolation. It's a lack of community. And God created a woman, and it became the first relationship the first community, the first family. God made us for community. It is something God designed, and community is a good thing because it's designed by God. It's something we, we may not talk about so often, and it's a community is that community tends to be elusive, isn't it? Community, community can be hard to find. And some of you are in a season where it's been difficult to make friends or find connections or feel like you know or think you are loved by someone. Some of you may have just moved to the area and you have been thinking a lot about old friends and you've been struggling to find new friends, new connections in this place. Some of you have been looking for people with whom you can really connect and trust but you don't have time, or it seems like they don't have the time. Some of you are just out of a relationship or a marriage maybe, and it's painful. You're not sure what you should do or or who you should talk to. Some of you are just into a relationship, and and, and you're not sure if that is who you should be in a relationship, but what, what is next? Some of you might be dealing with a struggle or an addiction or a sin in your life and you're not not sure if you can trust someone and build a relationship. And yes, you come to church, but you sort of come to church and you sit and so you sort of hide from everyone and as soon as the guy asks you to hug someone, you go, oh, did he really have to do that? And as soon as the guy says, well, please join us for a cup of tea and coffee, you you duck and you make an excuse because you don't want to connect. Some of you have a calendar that is so booked up, so filled with appointments and events and to-dos and family needs, but you're going through the motion and inside you just sort of feel alone all the time. Here's the thing about this. It's really important. Just because you are with people doesn't mean you are in community. Just because you are with people, just because you have a lot of connections, just because you might have 17,000 friends on Facebook, doesn't mean you actually are in community. You see what I'm saying? Community is good. It's a God thing. But it can be an elusive thing. Maybe that's where some of you are. Maybe if you're honest, if you kind of feel frustrated, kind of tired, for looking for it. Maybe some of you are tired of hearing about it. The same can be true for community and we can make it sound so amazing, so inspirational, uh, but it can be painful. Community can be painful. 
for our time together, for the rest of our time together, I want to do something a little bit different. And I want to just walk through a series of how-to questions. And the last couple of weeks we've been talk- talking about a little about what what of the community. And, and we've kind of talked about the why of the community. But today I want to, to talk about the how. The how-tos of community. Make it really practical. And if you're one of those people that like to take notes, I've put it in the sh- on the screen for you so you can follow nicely. And, and I want to just walk through this questions. I want to, to make it really concrete, really candid. Uh, I want to, to give you five simple how-to questions, starting with this one. How do I find community? How do I find community? The real simple thing, well, the first thing we need to see with this question is how we won't find community. And here's the thing, you won't find it unless you do something about it. I mean, on the 2nd of February, it was exactly a year since we've come here. So we, are, we have been with you guys for a year and a few days. Can you imagine? I mean, can you, can you believe it? It's going so quickly. And, and, and the thing that we had to be confronted with when we came here is we've got a lot of friends in Joburg. Lots. I mean, I've, I've been to Joburg since 1982 when we moved to South Africa. Tammy was born in Johannesburg. I was born in the Alberton area. I sort of was more in the northern part of Johannesburg. But Johannesburg was our place. You know, we got used to the hustle and bustle of Johannesburg. We got used to the shopping centers of Johannesburg. We got used to the traffic jams of Johannesburg. It was, it was our place and we made connections. We've got lots of friends. I've got friends from school. She's got friends from school, from the different churches that I was ministering around Johannesburg. But when we came here, it was quite a move. It was far away. It's seven hours drive to Johannesburg. One hour and 45 minute flight from East London to Johannesburg. It's not an easy thing to connect. And whether you like it or not, that connection eventually becomes less and less through WhatsApp and Facebook and all that kind of stuff. So we had to make a decision that one of the things, one of the struggles that we will have is making friends here. Okay? So that's easy. You're a minister and you're always with people. But remember what I said, just because you're always with people doesn't mean that you're in community. And this is not to make you feel guilty. But many times, I know some of you get together for a braai or something like that and We've got nothing to do on that weekend. We don't get invited. And there's many weekends that we are alone at home. We've got absolutely nothing to do. You know? So it doesn't necessarily mean because us ministers are with people all the time that we've got lots and lots of friends. As a matter of fact, a lot of ministers will tell you one of the loneliest things is to be a minister. Because people sort of are a bit reluctant to, to have a relationship outside of a church with a minister. Again, I didn't say that to make you feel guilty. But that is one of the things that we had to struggle. So for us, it became a huge thing that we had to, we had to, to do something about it. We had to make connection. If we were not invited, we will invite ourselves. Okay? And then we made you feel guilty. And go, whoa, you didn't do many is coming to see us. You know, we better clean the house. We better get rid of all the alcohol and, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. But we had to do something about it in order to be connected to a community. And, and we've made friends. We've made friends inside a church, outside of the church. But it, it, it had to happen. Now back to our question, how do you find community then? Well, the first step is always to take the initiative, isn't it? That's always the first step. I love the way Jesus challenges people when, when they were craving something, when they were hungry for something, when they desired something. He challenged them to take the step. And listen to what Jesus says. It's like straightforward, so simple. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Simple. Notice that each of these results hinges on a personal action, a personal step, a personal step of 
initiating. So you want to get into community? Initiate it. What's the worst thing that would happen? They will say no. We've all had rejection. I think we can handle rejections by now. This is especially important in our community and relationship. Finding community starts with seeking. I know this can, can seem really basic, really simple, but for some of us, God brought you here this weekend, this Sunday. Maybe you needed to hear that. And maybe you need to stop saying, well, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, I'm going to be eat, eating some worms. Well, maybe you need to initiate to do that with someone as well. Maybe you need to find a common denominator with that person. You need to take a step. You need to step out. You need to take a risk. Maybe it's getting involved in a church group or in a community group. Believe you me, this year you will get plenty of chances to do something. And if you don't get involved, it's your bling. Okay? You can't do everything, but you can do at least one thing. I mean, there you go. I mean, we're just within, within this month, we've got the market coming up. We've got the Women's World Day of Prayer coming up. You can get involved there. You can seek out community. There are three Bible study groups or home fellowship groups that are meeting every day of the week. There is on Thursday, there's on a Friday, and there's a one on a Wednesday, isn't there? Yeah. There's a pastoral group. A group of us who meet together at 11 o'clock on uh, once a month and we pray and we talk and we eat nice cakes and drink nice coffee and biscuits and things like that so yeah but i can't pray well you can try and be there you concern about people and the people that you know in our community of a church and outside there is a bible study on a friday night that is that is run and they meet together and they struggle with issues and they talk about issues and common people like you and I find out, find out who it is I know all of them so I can direct you and say can I, can I be a part of your group there's a fellowship group that meets in the morning and, and they have fellowship one of these days I'm going to come and get crashed that fellowship group and, and there better be a chocolate cake in there you know, but they fellowship. Another one meets also in the morning on a Thursday and they, they study a Bible. They study the Bible. They study a, 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 a topic or whatever. Get involved. Get involved. If you're one of those people that gets approached by a member of the congregation are saying to you, well, you know, we think you're good, a good material for an elder and you sort of like, mm, I don't know, I'm not sure, step out. Speak to every elder that's, that has been an elder, whether they thought they are ready to be an elder. And they will tell you they felt so underqualified. But step out. Be a part of a community. That's, that, is, that is something that we need to do. So that's, that's number one. Number two is how do I build community? Well, if I've been looking for it, I've been taking those steps, I've been reaching out, I've been having conversations with people, how do I now build it? How do I make it stick? Because not everyone sticks, not every relationship sticks. I mean, I've got lots of relationships in my life that they were really solid relationship, but something just happened. And, and they sort of disappeared. I mean, we, because of moving here and the distance and so on, we've lost a lot of relationships there were good solid relationships people we could trust people we were fellowshipping with people we trusted our children to leave them to babysit after our children and just because of distance and business and stuff like that those those relationships have gone so how do i make it stick the question can seem like it, it would just be the common sense doesn't it but you would be surprised how many really smart competent educated people can almost sabotage community before it begins to take place. Too often we approach community from a practical posture and we approach community with this question, what can I get out of this? What can I, I get out of this? What can I get out of this community? How can I benefit out of this community? What can these people do for me? 
How will this community meet and serve my needs? And do these people look like the kind of people I want to be friends with? When we do this, it's very subtle, but the shift happens when we turn community into a commodity. Okay? Community becomes something we want to use or consume or store up for ourselves or help us feel better about ourselves. We killed that community before we even started being a part of that community. That is change. To build community, to break through the level of superficial connection and, and all that kind of stuff. Our question, our posture must shift from what can I get out of this into what can I give to this. It's so simple, but this is, can be a life-changing thing. And I've seen so many people enter into a community, enter into a group, and say, well, you know, what are they going to do for me, rather than what I can do for them. I've been sharing with you for some quotes from this book, Life Together by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Bonhoeffer writes about the first practice we need to bring to community in order to build it. And he says the first thing we need to do, listen to what he writes. He says, the first service one owes to another in fellowship consistency is listening to them. I get frustrated because I want this to be like rocket scientist, super spiritual, all deep kind of stuff. And the first thing we are supposed to do, the main priority according to him, we bring at the beginning is just listening to them. Attending to someone else, being focused on someone else's story, their question, their needs, not your own. Then listen to what else he says. He says, many people are looking for an ear that will listen. They do not find that among Christians because these Christians are talking where they should be listening. Have you ever come across those kind of Christians? He goes on to say this is the beginning of death of the spiritual life. This is how serious this is. In the end, there is nothing left the spiritual chatter that has been done by pious words. Have you ever been around a Christian who just loves to hear themselves talk? Hey? Why are you all looking at me? I was in a group once and there was this guy who, who always had something to say about scripture or the Bible or politics or religions to the point that no one else could get a word in. And it literally annoyed every person until Tammy finally stood up and just told me I need to shut up. Okay, I'm joking. You know, it's, it's this very subtle but essential shift when we come into this process of others. What question are you asking? What can I get out of this? What am I supposed to bring to this? What can I give? What do I have to offer? Am I excited about everyone getting to know me and my stories? Or am I here to see where I can fit in and what I can do? And then out of it I might get something. In the New Testament, James writes, he says, Everyone should be quick to listen, but slow to speak. So who does this apply to? Everybody. It doesn't matter if you're a leader. It doesn't matter if you have been in, in groups the longest. It doesn't matter if you feel like you know more. It doesn't matter if you feel like someone else doesn't know enough and you have to all these answers. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. So here's my challenge to you with this one. Right here in the community, as you are trying to build a try this, try this step, especially if you feel like you are struggling to make connections, especially if it feels like community has always been this kind of, of thing that you've been getting out of it. Ask yourself the question, what can I do in this community? Ask this question. And that might start working. The next point how do I deepen community? I've built it. How do I deepen community now? 
One of the most common statements, observations, question I hear from home groups is a real simple one. It's people who say, but I want to go deeper. We meet, we have a care time and fellowship time and, and all of that stuff, but I want to go deeper. How do we go deeper? How do we have more significant conversation or more connections or closer closeness? How do we have that kind of uh, epiphany intimacy with each other? And some of some of you have communities are uh, in home groups or in study groups, fellowship groups, in this church, outside of this church. You meet regularly with others, you have spiritual conversation, but you are wrestling with the sense of how do we actually go deeper together? Hey, am I speaking to anyone here? We say, no, oh, we do that, but I want that deeper connection. I mean, how you were saying that this year we want to get deeper with God? How do I get deeper with God? How do I get deeper with those people and with God? And I can tell you, I've been in community groups where we've tried a number of different things to get to the place of the sense of, of depth. And they've changed how they study the scriptures and how they read different books and try different curriculums. And all of these practices are good, but they can all be helpful. But one thing that stood out as a breakthrough and as it transcended all these attempts to bring depth, and again, it's what Bonifay in his book Love Together calls active helpfulness. Active helpfulness. If you want depth in your community, whatever community you're part of, it's this idea of being helpful. It defines helpfulness in this way. It says, it's a simple assistance in, in trying to look at external matters. So I have to say, I find, I find this so frustrating because I want depths to be about these kind of deep moments of mountaintop experiences. And he says, no, no, no. If you want deep community, you need to be there. You need to show up even when it seems insignificant. Some needs to ride, someone needs to ride to the airport, someone needs a, a last minute favor, someone needs a babysitter. You see, the way we bring depth into community, it's not by our attempts to go deeper, but it's the way we bring depth is by showing up and helping us. It's as simple as that. Because when you show up, it means you're interested. And you know what? The same thing goes for church. The same thing goes for church. And I know some of you got good excuses why you don't come every Sunday. Some of you got just excuses. But the thing about church and the thing about the community of church is in order to make this work, you need to show up. Because in showing up, you get to understand about the life of the church. You get to understand every Sunday, and if you, I don't know if you've noticed, but every time I talk to you guys on Sunday, it builds up, builds up, builds up, builds up to something. Now, if you're not a part of it, and yes, you can listen to it on, on Facebook, you can listen to it on WhatsApp, you can listen to it on the app if you downloaded the app, and if you haven't downloaded, we've got one more week of free, and then it cancels. Okay, I've got eight members. Okay, it doesn't take me to be a genius in finance to say that it's profitable for eight people. Okay, so really try and download that app. It's very easy, it's very informative. But you need to stay connected and you need to stay connected with people. I mean, there might be someone here that you saw that you haven't seen for a while. It might be a good thing for you to go to that person and say, I haven't seen you for a while. And why is that? You know, please forgive me. I didn't phone you. I didn't SMS you. I didn't come and see you. But I've noticed you haven't been around. It's so nice that you're around here today. And connect. But you need to show up. And I think that when you show up, that's when depth happens. That's when a person can say, you know what? I've seen that person in, in every Sunday, every Sunday at church, and I'm struggling with it. That kind of looks like a kind of person that, that I can approach and say, listen, will you pray with me? 
I just need prayer. If you haven't been a part of the church and you don't come every Sunday, how do you know the character of elders that need to be elders? You don't really know them. So it's important. And we're being very honest here. I said we were going to be honest. Here's the thing. We, we live in a culture where we need to... We, 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 we worship our time, isn't it? Our time is our treasure. Our time is the most important thing. And we feel like it's so costly just to give up a few moments of a time. But the greater cost comes when we aren't willing to give up a short-term time to be there, to be helpful in terms of, of a long-term loss of community. Let me speak to the guys who were involved in last year, Tambuki. It was hard work. The steakhouse is not for sissies. But what we really enjoyed, what I really enjoyed, was the community, was the fellowship. We, were, we stopped for about two hours, I think it was, because, you know, there was uh, something on, a show on, or whatever. We knew we were not going to sell. We needed a break. And, you know, we put our feet up, and some of us walked around and stuff. That was enjoyable. The fellowship was enjoyable. Someone came to me the other day and said, you know, I really enjoy the coffee and the tea and the biscuits after the service. Because I get, to, I get to chat to people. I get to, you know, to see a person that I haven't seen for a long time. You know, two new people came, came the other Sunday to church and, and they SMSed me during the week and they said, you know, thank you for the warm welcome that the church gave us. And that's community. And I felt so, so welcome that they've already acted out towards this community and they haven't they've been one Sunday with us but praise God for for that and praise God for for the fact that they felt that there is community in here and it can be a part of the community and I'm speaking here to people who who might be you know new to this church or might have been here since kingdom come you know I'm speaking to both we need this community number three no, that was number three. Sorry. Number four. How do I preserve my community? How do I preserve it? Because I made it deep. I made it connection. How I build it up. How do I preserve the community? And this is an interesting one. You see, for, for some of you, you have really good community thing going. You, you maybe are one of those community people and, and you've you got many community. Some of you have a group or, or a community and you meet together and you know each other and you know the stories and you know the children's stories and the grandchildren's stories and you can finish each other's sentence and you study the scriptures and you have it all done and you're in, in the hall of fame of communities and you understand community and, and some, of you, some of you are blessed with that and that's great. But when we get into seasons like that, the strange dynamic begins to emerge in community. We begin to think, how do I protect this? How do I preserve this? How do we protect this dynamic? It's such a good thing. The problem is that when community is not a risk, the question is, what makes community the risk of getting stale? Or being a cliche? Or being a click? Being an insider's focus. It's kind of a counterintuitive thing, isn't it? Because community is supposed to be welcoming. And if you want to preserve the quality of community, you have to dis disrupt it sometimes, doesn't it? You have to invite others in. I just recently heard a, the story of a group, and not in this church, in one of the other churches here, and of a group who invited someone who wasn't a Christian at all. But one of the people in the group said, you know, I'll go every Wednesday to this group. Why don't you come with? And let's call that person Mike. And there was this fear that having Mike in the group would kind of ruin the dynamic of this group that has been meeting for 10 years. They've had it down. They've had, they do community 101, 102, 103, and 104. They've written a thesis, a PhD on how to do community. So, so they've been doing it. But now the problem was is how do we invite Mark and how is Mark not going to ruin this community? Would change all of the, all, all the experience they've just been together? And, and what are they going to do about this? Because Mark doesn't know all the stories. And I worried it was going to mess up the chemistry, change the dynamic. 
And guess what? It did. Mark didn't know all of the Bible story. Mark wasn't living his life the same way they all lived. Mark brought some colorful language into the group that was sort of different to their language, if you know what I mean. But some really cool things began to happen as well. You see, they didn't just read the Bible. They actually had to now wrestle with the Bible because the questions that Mark was bringing into that group was not just Jesus loves you this I know for the Bible tells me so. There were some really interesting questions he was bringing. And they couldn't avoid some of those hard sticky questions. They had to actually address them and wrestle with them. They didn't just close the time with kind of a routine prayer. They had to learn to talk to God because someone was in the room who didn't understand all the assumptions that they knew about. The so-called outside help them build real community again. Not to mention what this did for Mark in his life and he began to discover the reality of God and the joy of the community and eventually in that community he made a decision to follow Jesus Christ and not even a year later he was baptized. Because that community recognize that they had to be disrupted and maybe that right person had to come into not the right person had to come into that and you know we we're going to talk about it some other time but we say well we all you all agreed on it i said to you do you guys like this do you agree with it the elders the board members we had a workshop they agreed on it but at the end of the day i needed to ask you and we chose the logo and we chose the, the, the three words and one of the words is we said everyone is welcome everyone or some of the people and if we say no one is perfect does that mean if someone is not perfect and we know their imperfection? Does that mean we're going to invite them in or not? Here's my question. Do you think that experience strengthened or weakened their community? Do you think that experience of having this outsider came in and changed the dynamic and disrupted the flow, strengthened or weakened that community? I think it made it stronger. See, what is so, so interesting about community for us, it can be counterintuitive. When Jesus calls his 12 disciples to get into community, never once did he say, don't mess up the dynamic. He never said to them, don't ruin the chemistry. We have this kind of neat thing going here. He never said it. He said, go invite people in, make disciples, multiply your circles, bring the wrong people in. As a matter of fact, here is how you bring the wrong people in. You invite yourself to their house to have supper. And you get everyone else in town talking about it. So much so that they label you and say, he's a friend of sinners. You see, that's what Jesus said. He says, go and make disciples. Go to everywhere and make disciples. That's our challenge as well. And it's for me as well. If you've been in the same group with the same people for all those years, you need to disrupt it. And I'm coming. I'm coming. I've spoken to those groups. And I'm not going to tell you when I'm coming. I know when you meet, what time, I'm going to come. And I'm going to disrupt that group. And I'm going to mess it up. Because that's what I do best. Okay? If you wonder what to get me for my birthday on the 19th of March, when I turn 47, is a big wooden spoon. Because I'm going to do this this year. I'm going to mess things up. You know, I was saying to the board, if the money runs out and you can't afford me as a minister and I have to look for another job, at least I go out with a bang. And you will remember me. <laughs> So we need to disrupt things. We need to, we need to not get complacent and stay where we are because we need to change. If your group is just made out of all the people, maybe you need someone younger. 
if anything, to teach you how to download this app. <laughs> Which is very, very easy. It's so funny, after the service on Sunday, last Sunday, it was the youngsters who were sitting with the other people's cell phones and going, this is how you did, blah, 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 five seconds. Wow. Okay, go slowly. <laughs> Number five, last one. How do you sustain community? How do you sustain community for the long run? How do you sustain it? If you are blessed to find it, if you are so blessed to experience it in your life, how do you sustain it? It's easy in our culture now today to assume that you sustain relationship with people whom you are, have a common thing, common denominator, common, common interest, things like sports or art or activities or something similar in your life. Those are important connections and we need those connections. But we need them to help us understand how to move through the seasons of life that we will experience. And here's the thing, common interests, commonality, doesn't hold community together. Forgiveness does. Forgiveness does. Again, it's so counterintuitive to, to say that because, you say, but wait a minute, if we are deeper, surely we have forgiven each other? Have we? Just a quick question. Just a moment of honesty, a moment of, for all of us to confess. How many of you have a person in your life who you don't like? Don't look at that person right now. Just raise your hand. Somebody in your life that you don't like. Come on, you are not all a bunch of saints. I know that. Come on. How many of you have got that person, okay? One of the areas I think Christians are the weakest is dealing with relationships where there is a tension or frustration. we rather walk away than deal with it. We don't like somebody, we want to say something, but we don't know how to say it, and we just, have to just walk, walk away. A friend of mine told me about a conflict with one of his friends, and it wasn't even a major one, but they didn't talk to, to each other for, about it for a while. Now, they, they, they just passed one another, and I mean, they are nice people, they are polite, and they are respectful, but they just kind of pass by. Now, there is no more laughter or depth in the conversation. It's very superficial conversation, but they don't even talk about it, and it sounds so mundane listening to them but this happens all the time someone hurts your feeling someone lets you down someone didn't invite you where you thought you should have been invited someone talks about you behind your back someone betrays your trust because you said to them please don't mention it to anyone else and they sort of forgot about that clause and they sort of did and you find about it and in that moment you think, gosh, community has been broken. And you want to step away, you want to say, okay, you know what? I'm not going to be a part of this group. You want to, to back up, you want to protect yourself. And, and the vision happens. And that's how the vision happens in churches. I've been, I've been involved with, not, not myself as a minister, but, but I've been involved in churches where I ended up being a moderator, interim moderator, where, where there's division the because they thought he said that about so and so and and it just broke the community and listen to this the very moment you think community is broken can be the moment community is finally built this is so important we live in a world where social connections and acquaintances are fun together and and, and we don't do that anymore then something happens and even even on social media that happens and it's so funny because it makes it sound, look so easy on social media. You just go to your general, you look after your, at your friends, you take out that friend and you just press the button and you uninvite. Boom. Unbefriend. Boom. Like, I'm not your friend anymore. <laughs> and they made it that easy. We make it that easy. 
But the moment you think community is broken can be the moment the real community, the community you are made for, the community to desire is finally built. It's not through avoiding it, but it's through forgiving it. And if you are in a community right now, whether it's a small group, Bible study group, home cell groups, whatever it is, at work, when you feel that that has happened, Maybe you need to step out and say, well, maybe forgiveness needs to be in there. I love how the Apostle Paul kind of puts those things together. And he writes in Colossians, he says, bear with each other. You know, they're just challenging just to think about that. Just to bear with each other. Something that is so not easy to do. To bear with each other. But he says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone... Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Is there anything you could do that God could not forgive you? No. When God forgave you, you need to forgive. So these, these are the points of how do, we, how do we do this? How do we get into the community? And how do we sustain the community? Is some of you right now are feeling a little convicted that you approach community with that kind of, of consumer behavior? What can they do for me? Maybe it's time to look someone in the eye and think about what about them? And some of you are thinking, how do we go deeper but you just don't have time to give? Maybe that's just it. Maybe you need to give your time. Maybe you need to give some of your time. Maybe you, maybe you just need to show up. Maybe you've been making excuses after excuses and you've been getting an invite and after invite to the church, to the group, but somehow you're just always busy on that particular day or, or that particular time. How about showing up, be present with people's lives? Maybe that's a step God is calling you to take this morning. Some of you are in a great community, but in, in, in that verse of kind of is kind of a stale environment, you're getting superficial and you need to preserve it, you feel like you, you're losing it, well maybe you need to bring someone to mess things up and stir things up. And maybe some of you can't sustain that community. So right now I want to challenge you, everyone who's listening right now, to tell God, which step do you want me to take? Which step do you want me to take? Which step are you calling me to take? And commit to that. And say, God, I'm going to take a step this week. Just one little step. And I'm going to get out of my comfort zone. And I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I'm going to take one little step this week in pursuit of the community that is a God thing, and it's a good thing, and you designed it. So, this is what I challenge you to do. Let's do that together as a family in the church. Let's pray. Lord, we, we come before you and we offer those little simple commitments. Not because it's up to us, but because you've invited us to seek. So we might find and ask, so we might receive. Jesus, we need you this week to walk with us as we take these steps into the communities, into relationship, into forgiveness, into invitation, into being there for people. We need you this week, Lord, like we've never needed you before. To give us courage and strength and confidence to take that step where we need to take the step. And we thank you, Lord, for taking the first step for us to initiate, to draw near, to be with us, to bear with us and to forgive us. And Lord, as a family here in St. Columbus, Lord, allow each one of us to work together as a team. Allow each one of us to find what it is that I can be and what it is that I can do in this family called St. Columbus Presbyterian Church and what can I bring into and to show up and be connected 
Lord, I pray that every time that we find that we have a good excuse that you will stop us in that track and that you will remind us that maybe we need to step out and just show up. Give us courage as we take a step. And we pray this in your name. Amen. We're going to stand as we sing our last song together. And it's God me, oh thy great Jehovah.